Hi guys, it's Christina from Blossom and Root. A few weeks ago I put out um, a couple of different videos showing what I was going to be using for kindergarten with my youngest daughter and second grade with my oldest daughter and I got a lot of really awesome comments and feedback um, through our email and Facebook and Instagram about those videos and I had a few people request that I please make a video um, kind of looking back over the first grade year um, using Blossom and Root First Grade. So this video serves two different purposes. The first one is to talk to you about what I actually did with my daughter um, in our homeschool for first grade. And the second purpose is to show you inside Blossom and Root First Grade. So I'm gonna be doing both of those things with you here in this video. I'm gonna go ahead and get started with language arts because I think it was my daughter's absolute favorite subject this year. Um, we used Blossom and Root First Grade. Uh, and the, the language arts curriculum for that year is called The Stories We Tell. And it focuses mostly on fairy tales and folk tales, but we do do a pretty long unit at the beginning of the year where we read through the Among the People series by Clara Dillingham Pearson. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and show you inside the parent guide for that before I show you um, some of my daughter's work in the notebook and also talk through uh, what we liked about it and what worked about it and where I wish we had done more. So, sorry for the jumbliness. This is what the parent guide looks like inside our language arts curriculum. And it looks really similar in our second grade year and it will look pretty similar in our third grade year, although those two include quite a bit more geography and other things too. So if you take a look, it'll tell you each week what stories to read out loud to your child. And um, I do want to make a quick note that the book selections we recommend in first, second, and third grade are all meant to be read aloud to the child. They are not intended for the child to read to themselves. Although if you are doing this curriculum with an older child or a more advanced reader, you're certainly welcome to have them do that if you would like. But you'll notice in second grade we have some book selections like The Hobbit and The Wind in the Willows. And we do not intend for a normal second grader to read those to themselves. That is meant for the parent to read to them. I just wanted to clear that up because I get that question sometimes. Anyway, <laughs> this is the liter sele literature selection that you will read to your child that week. And then we recommend a couple of literature projects for you to do. One of them's kind of the core literature project and the second one is an optional project that you can add to it. And sometimes those are um, additional nature studies uh, related to the themes and the stories. And then in the second half of the year, it's exploring all the different countries that the folk tales come from. So it's more of a geography focus in the second half of the year. Then um, there are a couple things that your student will do in their notebook, which I'll show you next, including a journal prompt and a narration prompt, both of which we recommend in the first grade that you write for your child and they tell you what they want you to write down so they're not consumed with grammar, handwriting, spelling, and all of that stuff. We just want it to be um, focused on creativity and the thought process. So if you have an advanced writer, of course they could do that too. And then on the second half, you have the wordplay lesson for the week. And for first grade, we mostly are sticking with CBC Word families. And um, we do go over things like silent E rules and a couple of other things. So we also include a number of sight words in the first grade curriculum. And even though a lot of these are words that they will eventually learn how to decode as they read, um, it helps them to read a greater variety of literature to themselves if they can just get a couple of these words figured out first. So words like the and where those are words that um, if they can read those, they'll have a much bigger variety of things that they can read as they are um, starting to read independently. So that's why we do those in the first grade. They are not in the second grade and upward. <laughs> and then in the notebook, you have the word list for the week, which you will use to um, practice these words with your child. And then they will review using the word list and then a mini poem. And I'll show you what that is in just a bit. There is an optional copy work selection. We only did this maybe once a month this year because my daughter was just um, not quite there yet with handwriting where she could do the full copy work selection every single week. And then um, optional additional reading, 
where you incorporate independent reading daily from an early reader at your child's level. We did do that pretty often. We mostly used um, the Billy and Blaze early reader series this year for those. So that is what the parent guide looks like. Um, each week is on one full page and you can kind of go through and check off as you work through it. And um, that's what that looks like. So now I'm going to show you her notebook and then I'll kind of talk about different activities we did together and show you some pictures and videos of her doing them. So you can kind of see it come to life <laughs> because really that's where the heart of this curriculum is, is in um, the creative projects and the hands-on activities. And the notebook is really just a way to document um, all the stories that you shared together and the experiences that you had together. So this is the student notebook. This is my daughter's. I do wanna um, make a really quick recommendation. I recommend if you buy our curriculum and you get the student notebook bound, that you use a tough material for the back cover. We just went with this paper one and it ripped right away and it's just getting kind of messy and frayed. And if I had used um, a tougher, like the vinyl cover option, I think it would have helped the whole thing stay together better. So that's a quick recommendation. I'm gonna be doing that with our second grade notebook so that it doesn't fall apart <laughs> um, because this gets a lot of use. So I'm gonna go ahead and open it up so you can kind of see a typical week in the student notebook. So the very first thing is the literature journal entry. You'll see a prompt that you read aloud to your child. And um, I always like to take some time to talk to Blake about her ideas and stuff before we started um, her entry. And then I usually let her draw the picture first because she got a lot of ideas by working through the picture. That's kind of how her brain works. Um, some kids might prefer to tell you the story of what they want to write down first and then illustrate it. It just depends on your child. So um, Blake really likes to color, so she would take her time with all of these. And uh, then she would tell me what she wanted me to write down. So that's what's going on on that page. And the prompt, just so you know, was, um, why is it important to work together? Can you think of a time when you needed to work together with family or friends? And that relates to the theme in the story that we read that week. And then she has her narration page. And this was one of her favorite stories. It's The Selfish Tent Caterpillar. And that's from the Among the People series by Clara Dillingham Pearson. And so again, she would usually do her illustration first, and then she would tell me the whole story and I would write it down. Now you'll see as I flip through the book that sometimes this went on and on. You guys, I was like, should I start typing these? Because I would fill up the whole page and then flip it over and write the whole back of side of the page too, and she still wouldn't be done. <laughs> so if you have a child who really likes to elaborate their stories, I, I think next year I might actually do some typing before she's ready to start writing her own, um, just because it, it would be a lot easier on me than this was. But I love that I have all these great stories from her preserved forever in this little notebook. Um, it's such a treasure. And a lot of times, you guys, Blake would start out telling the story I had actually read, and then it would go off on this crazy tangent <laughs> that didn't actually happen in the story, but I always rolled with it. I'm totally great with that creative interpretation, and I always just let her kind of run with it. Um, it's a little different if you're doing narration for science or history, obviously, but for language arts, I went with it. I know that's like a personal choice um, for the parent. So then we have uh, the word lists, and these are words we would build with our manipulatives. Um, we have these little, we have a few different manipulatives that we used. We have unifix cubes that have word or letters on them and letter sounds on them. And then we have wooden craft letters that I bought at Michael's, and those became the favorite thing to build the words out of. And she would just kind of use that until she got it, and then she would read the list to me. And then you have the sight words as well, and little practice sentences to read. And um, just really quick, the journal entry we usually did one day. We did the narration on a different day. And the word list we would break up over two days usually. And then we would do the mini poem. So this is the mini poem. And when you first get the page, all these little words that she has glued in are at the bottom in a word bank. And so we would read through the poem together with the blanks. Um, sometimes she could read it all by herself and sometimes she needed my help. So whichever she needed me to do at that particular week, 
I would just help where needed. And then um, she had to kind of use some deduction and um, detective work to figure out which words went where. And then um, I always had her wait to glue it down until she played with them and made sure everything made sense. And then she would glue it down. And she usually did an illustration. So this was one of the rare weeks that we did do the full copy work. Or I think we didn't do the full one. It looks like it's about half of it. And, um, and I just, I let her use crayon. <laughs> um, I don't always make her use pencil when we do it. And then again, we have the journal, the narration, the word list, and the mini poem. These are great because not only does it help them work on their reading skills, but it is instilling this grammar foundation in there too because um, words that don't make sense being placed in certain places because they're not a noun or because they're not a verb, even if your child doesn't know what a noun or a verb is, they still know that that kind of word doesn't belong in that spot. So it's like this precursor to working on grammar and it's really effective. And she really liked doing those. So I'm gonna flip ahead. She really took her time with all her drawings. I think there was only like one or two weeks where she was in a hurry um, to get it over with. See, there's one of her really long narrations. <laughs> that was for Hansel and Gretel. Um, but yeah, I just, I absolutely love flipping through her notebook and seeing all the stories that we read together and remembering all of um, the experiences of reading through these together. <laughs> that's uh, the giant from the Brave Little Tailor. So uh, that's the notebook. And um, we, we totally broke this up over four or five days a week. So we kept the lessons pretty short. I would say 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day um, for notebook work. And I usually read her stories one time at the beginning of the week, and they're pretty short in the first grade curriculum. There are a few exceptions. For example, the Snow Queen is really long, especially the version that we used. So um, we took our time and we stretched that one out, I think over two or three different weeks because we wanted to do a lot of the activities too. So that's that. Now I'm gonna talk really briefly about some of the activities that we did. Um, while we were going through this curriculum, one of Blake's favorite parts of the curriculum, and Bryce's, honestly, my younger daughter, was acting the stories out. So that was a narration activity that's included in almost every single week in the first grade curriculum. We have some form or another of narration play. So sometimes we would make peg dolls for the characters in the story, and we would act it out. We'd use scarves and pine cones and rocks and things like that to build the world of the story. And then they would take turns telling the story to me with the peg dolls. We did puppets a couple of times. We acted the play out ourselves several times where we would each pretend to be a character in the story and we'd use stuffed animals to fill in for the roles. Um, and then we did a few other projects. Let's see, we made a gingerbread house for Hansel and Gretel um, and just things like that. Now, the one regret I had from the first grade language arts um, this past year was that we didn't have as much time as I wanted us to have to go deep into some of her favorite stories and the activities that were involved. But that's just kind of rolling with it and going with the flow. There were weeks where we had lots of time and weeks where we had less. And so we just kind of rode the waves. So I'm gonna move on to math next. Now we started out the year using Singapore math, um, we use the standards edition. And the first half of the year, we completed 1A and we did everything. We did um, all the activities in the home instructor's guide. We did every single page in the workbook, every single page in the textbook. And I even had the tests because Blake is one of those kids who really enjoys taking tests. Um, which I'm not, but she is, and so I ordered them anyway. And we had a great time and she learned a lot and it really is a solid program. That being said, it got really tedious. Um, and I was starting to feel like it really was sticking out like a sore thumb in our homeschool because everything else kind of has this air of experimentation and play and movement and there's a physical aspect to it and Singapore was all at the table in a workbook and it just got really tedious um, for us and so um, I had purchased wild math at the end of last summer and kind of sprinkled it in here and there um, 
while we were doing Singapore. But about halfway through the year, I started doing more out of the wild map and less out of Singapore. So I would go through wild map and I would just pick an activity that I wanted us to focus on or a topic I wanted us to focus on for the week. And I did not necessarily go in any particular order. Um, I definitely worked more from the front to the back of the book because there are certain skills that you build up in the front that you need toward the end. Um, but for the most part, I kind of hopped around a lot. And I would just say, okay, well this week we're gonna focus on place value, or this week we're gonna focus on patterns. And I would choose activities from the guide, and then I would um, put those into my plans for the week, and I would also put variations of those activities into my plans for the week, and that's what we would do. So a lot of times we ended up doing math outdoors. We would count our steps when we were on a hike. We would measure things all the time. We would do, we loved the 10 frame with sticks activity from this curriculum. We did that one a few times. Um, and then there was, there were favorite things that my kids really enjoyed doing. So we would do those on a regular rotation. So I started to like this style of math program so much more. And I pulled back big time from Singapore. I did order all the books for 1B, but I didn't end up using anything except just the home instructor's guide. So I would, um, for example, if we were working on addition, I would flip open to the, the home instructor's guide and see how they taught the concept of addition, how they explained it, different hands-on activities they suggested, and I would write them down. And then I would go to Wild Math and find coordinating activities for that same concept, and I would write those down as well. So I started using kind of a a mishmash of both programs together that worked really, really well for my daughter and really well for me and the flow of our homeschool. And it was one of the best decisions I had ever made in terms of math. And so next year for second grade, we're going to be using Wild Math as our, our spine. I'm going to be using the, the parent instructor guide or home instructor guide. Um, for Singapore, I'm not gonna be ordering the textbook or the workbook and we're just not gonna do them at all. Um, so we're going to use those two things and we're going to use beast math a little bit here and there too. So um, wild math was a huge success for us this year. I was really surprised at how much we ended up learning um, because when you first flip through it, it doesn't seem like what a math book usually looks like. But uh, I think that's the beauty of it and why it clicked so well with us. So and it's all hands on and using your body and my daughters just really learn really well that way. So. We absolutely love Wild Math, um, highly recommend, and I think it's a great fit for Blossom and Root. So that's math, and then um, we do do a lot of practice on the whiteboard, I did want to say that. Um, every single morning I do a whiteboard for my daughters, and we read a picture book together, and then we do the whiteboard together, and it just gives them a chance to practice some basic math skills and some reading skills, um, so it's kind of there every single day and consistent and they get used to working through problems that way as well. All right, let's move on to science. So we did Blossom and Root first grade, or year one, Wonders of the Earth and Sky. And this science curriculum is all about geology and meteorology. And so the first half of the year, we really dove in deep with geology and spent a great deal of time in that world. So much fun. We went on tons of field trips, we collected a massive amount of rocks and interesting fossils and things like that and just had a fantastic time. And then we took a bit of a break from science for about a month. And when we came back from that break, we did a condensed weather unit where we did the whole meteorology section of the curriculum in about six weeks. And then we did um, fossils. We kind of focused, micro focused on fossils in the month of May and used one of the book seeds that comes with the first grade curriculum, which is all about Mary Anning. And we did that whole book seed together, did a lot of museum visits, and went in deep with fossils at that point. So we did not follow it necessarily the way it's written, but um, I highly encourage parents not to do that if it doesn't work for them. Um, go in any order. You can you know, do the, the weather and seasons first, or you can do the seasons during the time of the year that um, relevant. Uh, you can do as much per week as you want, as little per week as you want. It's a very, very flexible curriculum. So I'm going to show you inside here real quick. We've got the parent guide. 
And it looks similar-ish to the language arts curriculum, except that on one side of the page, see this is the week on ever-moving plates, so it's plate tectonics. And I start out by telling you kind of the focus of the week and the big picture things to, to consider. These are the, like the main points we're trying to drive home. And then um, on the other side, you have a lot of options. So we always include a minimalist option because there's just those weeks where you just kind of want to get through it and move on, or it's not that interesting of a topic maybe to your child and you just kind of want to do the bare minimum, or you know, you're a minimalist homeschooler, which is totally great too. So that option's always there. And then we have a section called for the book basket folks. And these are all books that we recommend um, as optional things that you can add if you like to do a lot of reading in your homeschool. So if you're, you know, Charlotte Mason homeschoolers, for example, or you just like to have a lot of books to kind of help teach the lesson, um, we always give a pretty generous list. So hopefully you'll be able to find a few, if not all of them at your local library. And then we include video links because a lot of children are visual learners and videos can really help some of these concepts make more sense than trying to explain it from a book. So we always include some video links. And then the fun part is you get to mix and match from the activities. And I'll show you the lab guide in just a second, which is where all the directions for these are. But we always give an option for outdoor learners. So families like ours, who prefer to take their lessons outside most of the time. We have options for the table lab crowd, which are people who just like to do their science at the kitchen table. And then we have options for crafts and projects. So if your child's really into a specific unit, you might wanna do all three of those things. And we had a lot of weeks where we did all three of them, especially when food was involved. Um, we had quite a few weeks where the food demos were incredibly appealing to my daughters and we ended up doing multiple weeks for one topic. But then we also had minimalist, minimalist weeks where we just did the absolute bare minimum that week. And it was really fun to mix and match. And sometimes I thought of things to add to it that I hadn't when I was writing it. And that was also really fun too. And um, I know I see a lot of our parents in our parent group do that as well. And I always encourage that. I think it's fantastic. And please, when you do, share it on Instagram and tag us in it so we can see. Okay, so that's the activity section. Like I said, um, we did a lot of the outdoor ones. We went on a lot of field trips and we did a lot at the kitchen table um, and it was so much fun. And then the last thing is the notebook and I'll kind of explain what we did with that in a minute. First, I wanna show you the lab guide. So this is the laboratory guide and what the lab guide is, is it's all the and it's the um, supplies and instructions for each one of those activity options that I showed you in the parent guide. So when you open up the lab guide, say, let's see, what's a good one to show you? I mean, they're all really fun, but maybe this is a good one. Okay, so mountains and rifts. So this is the week for mountains and rifts. And so the outdoor learner option is the messy, muddy mountain demo. And so it kind of tells you what you need to find outside the kind of place you need to find outside to do it, and then all the instructions. And then in the next column, you have a fold mountain felt demo. And so it tells you what to get from the store and the instructions for that one. And then if you turn the page, you'll see this particular week we had two table lab options, and that happens a lot, where we'll have multiple options in each category. So on this particular week, we have the seafloor spreading demo, simplified. So we don't go into all the technicalities of seafloor spreading, but that being said, if your child gets really interested in it, we highly encourage rabbit trails throughout all of our curriculum. In fact, you'll see in the parent guide, we often suggest where they might fit in. So that's part of the, the joy of learning is getting to follow your curiosity. So the curriculum will always be there waiting for you when you're finished. Definitely take those side trips. They're so much fun. Okay. So uh, and then we have the craft and project one, which was map the mountains. And that was a really fun activity. I remember that one. So that's what the lab guide looks like. It's just the instructions and all the different materials you'll need. And for the most part, we try really hard to use things that you're probably already gonna have in the house. Every now and again, you might have to make a craft store run or a grocery store run, but we really try hard not to use any obscure things that you're gonna have to order special 
or go across town to find because I can't stand that. So that is the lab guide. Now, we do include a notebook with Blossom and Root Science. It's a simple notebook. It's got room for them to make a picture and notes about every single topic. It's not guided. There's no questions and answers. There's no tests. We don't tell them what to write. Um, it's more like a scientist's field journal. I want them to, we wanted them to have the opportunity to record what was important to them. So that's what the notebook looks like in Blossom and Root Science. And you can see samples on our website if you need to. Um, we started out using that. This is not it. <laughs> I'm going to flip to the pages in it. So we started out using that notebook and these are pages from that notebook. So as you can see, there's a little section to color, a section for her notes, which she told me what she wanted me to write down and I wrote them for her. And that's it. Um, so we started out with that. Here's her picture about the rock cycle, uh, crystals and minerals, volcanoes. Um, I think we did it for about mm, 10 weeks maybe. And then she told me she was frustrated because she wanted to make much bigger pictures <laughs> and she wanted to have the chance to um, have more detail in her drawings. So I went online to A Child's Dream, which is a Waldorf supply website, and I ordered these big main lesson books, and they're much bigger than our notebook. And I said, okay, well, this is, this is where you can take your science notes from now on. So we kicked off the weather unit by using this instead. Oh, that's her really cool window cling that she made about the layers of the atmosphere. But as you can see, she was able to make much bigger drawings in this notebook. And theirs are really nice because they have these onion skins between that kind of keep the crayon from smearing. And there's her clouds that she drew. And because she had room, she took her time so much more and put so much more detail and thought into her notes because this was her special scientist field notebook and she had much more space uh, to work with. So. It was, a, it was a good choice on our part. And I feel like if your child is the same way as her, where they really like to make big pictures, this is a great option. So is just a regular sketchbook. You can definitely just use a regular sketchbook instead of one of these. But um, here's her water cycle picture. And her snowflakes. Ooh, sorry. And the weather unit was really, really fun for us. And we actually ended up using another one for history and another one for... Um, just some math notes when we were, we did kind of a side unit on geometry and she wanted to make big pictures so we used one for math as well. So that was a really good choice for us and, um, and at the end of the year I just tore out the pages that she had started in the other notebook and I taped them in here so she would have them along with some other stuff we did like that's from a book seed issue called Up in the Garden and Down in the Dirt and uh, I thought it was so beautiful so I went ahead and put that in here too. Um, so that is science. I forgot to say <laughs> when we did math, I forgot to mention that we also used um, a couple of units from Moffitt Girls on Teachers Pay Teachers where we learned about uh, money. I didn't think the Singapore guide, and for that matter the Wild Math guide, didn't really touch on money very deeply and my daughter was very interested in it so I went online to Teachers Pay Teachers and I I purchased the first grade money unit and I downloaded it and it was really fun and she learned a lot and it was just kind of a nice change of pace. We did that one in January, February, so it was kind of that homeschool slump period and it was really great. So I do recommend that as well if you want to kind of hyper focus on one topic or another. That was a good fit. Um, and then we had, we had a lot of different things going on for the arts. So this is the art curriculum that goes with Blossom and Root First Grade. It's called Exploring the Math and Art. And the basic concept behind it is that you learn about a specific math concept, like line, shape, uh, whole and parts, patterns, balance, symmetry, that kind of thing. And then you look at artwork that has that element in it. And you do a picture study on that artwork. So you Google it, you look it up, you talk about it together. And then there is an art activity to explore it deeper. So um, let's see, there's a few that were favorites. Uh, we did, oh, it was Kandinsky. We did a Kandinsky shape study. And 
they loved it. It was so much fun. It was pretty early in the curriculum. So I'll show that one to you in the parent guide. So as you can see, we talk about what the math concept is for the week. Shapes can overlap each other. And then there is a featured work of art for you to Google and look at together. And then it kind of walks you through how to do the picture study and how to explore the math concept together. And then you do the art project. And then it tells you the supplies you'll need on the other side. So it's pretty simple. And these are really more process-based, open-ended art projects. They are not so much focused on a result. There are a couple times where we recommend your child um, work from a work of art. So kind of like they're inspiring themselves by working with the work of art, but they're not necessarily trying to copy it verbatim, um, just using it as inspiration. But most of the time they're really open-ended and process-based and fun. And uh, we really did enjoy it. We didn't get through all of them. We got through, oh, probably about half of them in here because uh, we just didn't have time to do them every single week. But um, we picked and we just kind of went through and picked ones that were the most interesting to Blake and did those. One of the reasons that we didn't have time to do more is because Blake went to an enrichment program one day a week, all year long, where she did a lot of art. <laughs> she did mixed media art and world art and theater and she even did cooking and all kinds of fun stuff at her enrichment program. So that kind of took care of the need for arts um, for the most part for the year. She also did horseback riding and a few other extracurricular activities. So that was our art curriculum for the year. And then I want to talk really briefly about the biggest frustration I had this year, which was history. And history, I, I knew it was going to be hard because there's just not much out there that satisfies our needs for a history curriculum yet. And I tried, I tried to use stuff that was already out there and found myself being very frustrated. I tried to use, we, we, we did um, a Native Americans unit and we used uh, those, if you lived with the Cherokee, if you lived with the Hopi series, I think it's a scholastic book series. And we also did the history pockets from Evan Moore. And the whole time we were doing it, I felt, well, I was frustrated because I don't like busy work and I felt like a lot of the, the history pockets were busy work, even though my daughter enjoyed a few of them. And I, I really felt like it just wasn't enough. And it, it was, um, it just didn't, it didn't feel right to me. <laughs> it didn't, um, it didn't feel like it did justice um, to that topic in general. And it often made it sound like like they were in the past and they don't exist now. That's what it made it feel like. Even though the books that I mentioned um, did have like a page at the end of each one kind of talking about where they live now, but it wasn't, it was like, hey, they, they live on reservations now, the end, you know, it didn't even talk about their culture or anything else. So I was really frustrated and I told my daughter, I said, you know what, we're gonna come back to this one once I find some better resources. And so I have recently come across some excellent resources thanks to someone I met through a parent group on Facebook, a homeschool parent group. And I will share a video all about that shortly, um, sometime this fall probably, and kind of go through my new plan with you because I feel like it's a much better fit. We did do a Colonial America um, unit. It was very brief because we started out with the history pockets again and I was like, oh, I can't do these again. So. Um, and it also was very whitewashed, for lack of a better term, and it just was not, it was not what I want. <laughs> so um, we decided to scrap that one, and I said we'll come back to that one after I have a chance to write one myself. <laughs> so I have been working on that for many, many, many months. Um, I'm, I've researched a ton. I can't wait to share more with you about that, but I'm not at a point yet where I can. So the last history unit that we did was Ancient Egypt. That one was really fun. So. We did not do history pockets. I found some excellent books um, and a couple just fun projects. We only spent a couple of weeks on it. It was really fun. Um, it was just like a light taste of ancient history. I intended to do Greece, Rome, uh, ancient Africa, ancient India, ancient China all around the same time, but uh, we just got busy. We started doing a lot of book seeds in the spring when the weather got nicer. So we are gonna come back around to those next spring instead. So that kind of wraps up everything that we did for first grade and it was wonderful. I would say the highlight for me was science 
and um, and language arts. And I think Blake made it very clear to me that language arts was her favorite as well. So I hope this kind of gives you guys a better picture of what's in Blossom and Root first grade, and hopefully it'll help help you um, kind of make choices for your first grader too in terms of math and all the other things I talked about. And um, you can find a lot more on our website. I keep a blog most of the year very regularly, not so much in the summer, but during the regular year I, I try every single week to kind of do a diary entry and show you what we did that week. So you can find a pretty good archive of those on our website, which is www.blossomingroot.com. And you can also see samples of our curriculum, scope and sequence, book list, things like that. And finally, if you have any questions um, that, are, that I can help you with, you can always email me. My email address is christina at blossomandroot.com, and I'll be happy to answer them for you. I hope you guys are having a fantastic summer, and I will share more with you about the history curriculum and all that stuff later on, closer to August and September. Have a great day, you guys. Bye for now.